All right. I hope everyone can see the screen. Um, today's presentation, we're going to be talking about tracking, uh, but really, um, it's a it's a presentation about uh, the impact of measurement on, um, on on strategy, on marketing strategy. Really, um, what's wrong with the current way we're doing tracking and how we got there? And so I, I hope this will give you some uh, some some uh, food for thought on uh, on how to think about measurement going forward. Uh, this might seem a little bit uh, like uh, thirty minutes of um, uh, negativity about online marketing, and it kind of is. Uh, but I think uh, if you take the right lessons from it, stick till the end, we'll uh, we'll we'll get to some valuable stuff there to to see what we can do with um, with with these problems. All right, so let me dive right into it. So, uh, as I said, we're going to be talking a bit uh, about uh, uh, the internet and and how advertising has affected the development of it, um, what situation we're currently in, and uh, where to go from there. So, um, just a few slides about us as an agency. I'll, I'll breeze through this because it's not, um, you know, what what you came here for, but still. Um, we're an international marketing agency um, uh, started in uh, in Denmark, uh, but uh, we're since in, uh, in 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 a few other places such as Poland and uh, Switzerland, um, Hong Kong, uh, and, uh, and and a few places around the world. We're very international uh, with uh, with specialists that speak um, about twenty languages, and um, so that's also kind of our um, our, our 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 USP in that we're. Uh, independent agency that still provides global coverage. Um, skip through that. Uh, this is me. Uh, beautiful picture. <clears throat> uh, so I'm a partner and an owner of the agency. Uh, in the agency, I mostly do the, the nerdy tech stuff, uh, SEO, but also work on client strategy, uh, new business and staffing. And before this, I had a um, background in uh, financial services, so I worked for Citibank and uh, also for Saxo in uh, in Copenhagen. I've uh, I've worked and lived in seven countries over the years, and uh, I'm now based in uh, in Holland. So, without further ado, the house that digital advertising built. So it's not a very good house, as you could see in the picture. Uh, for consumers, it meant uh, kind of bad media, a lot of clickbait, a lot of outrage culture. Um, social also uh, promoted addictive behaviors, and there was an erosion of privacy due to the hoarding of the, the different data that is needed for, uh, for, for, for all this stuff. For marketers, uh, it has meant too little focus on brand building, and we'll get into that later. Uh, somewhat of a data paralysis, because what numbers to look at. Uh, there's a lot of waste. And uh, we're interpreting uh, results based on bad incentives, actually bad data. And there's also a lot of fraud and robots that we might not be entirely aware of. So how do we get there? So I'm going to tell a story. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's not entirely chron chronologically uh, uh, factual, but um, let's not let the, the, the truth ruin a good story. Um, so it's a story about incentives. Uh, online advertising used to be bought uh, on, on impressions, more or less, so you knew kind of uh, how many visitors the website had and you could buy a spot there and that's sort of, you know, don't ask, don't tell, uh, don't, don't ask any questions. Uh, and the quality of those impressions didn't really matter. Um, and so the incentive was to get as many eyeballs as possible. Uh, and because of that incentive, the media quality suffered. So we then started to measure clicks as a way to, to judge the response. And then uh, very predictably, the incentive became to create ads that got clicks no matter what. So we got very large, confusing and irrelevant ads. Some of you might have even been around when you saw like little games inside banners that, that, that you know, had no connection whatsoever with the product being advertised, but um, at least uh, got you to click. And that was then the, the incentive. Uh, so we pretty quickly realized that clicks in themselves are not that great, and we started to focus more on audiences. 
So we initially did that through media titles, but there are only so many readers of the New York Times or FT or whatever uh, high end publisher you might think of. So the incentive for publishers and uh, tech platforms was to decouple uh, publications from audiences. And what I mean with that is uh, you, you might have a certain value uh, of, a, of a visitor that is visiting the New York Times because it's a very high end publication. Uh, but that same person also goes to yahoo.com. So if we can recognize that same person on that other site, there's a huge delta that those publishers can earn. And so this is exactly what happened, of course. And we started to target using data. So then uh, we, we kind of realized that clicks don't, don't really mean that much. And we started to measure conversions. So the incentive was, and in many ways, we we're still kind of there to focus advertising only on those people already ready to convert. So uh, to, to some extent, search advertising and retargeting, uh, their success as a channel was largely based on that uh, because these are people that uh, were already in the closing stages of their conversion funnel. And we're just kind of inserting an ad so that we can get the credit for it. But then do people really ask the question, would those conversions have happened anyway? A lot of them don't. So what do you get? You get an Oprah situation. Uh, everyone gets credit. You get credit, you get credit, everyone gets credit. If a, if a person converting uh, saw a print ad, then clicked on a banner and then searched and converted, which channel is really responsible for, for that conversion? So the incentive for advertising channels is to all claim credit, um, especially if you were the last one to touch that conversion. Um, and um, uh, it, it's yeah quite understandable, of course, because you want to show up in in the data set as being the the channel that 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 got that uh, conversion in the end, and then you'll get more money. The incentive for advertisers was to focus on that last touch channel too, because. And this is really, um, yeah, let, let's be honest. It's kind of easier to explain to your boss than to say, well, there, you know, there's this uh, thing 13 years ago that we did and then they talked to someone and that someone then searched and then they, they went to a, to a review site and then they did this and this and this. And then, you know, you kind of lose track. Uh, uh, someone in the C-suite is going to say like, yeah, that's all well and good, but I see here that Google brought you these conversions. We should spend more on that. Using that approach, though, uh, for a lot of larger firms, the results uh, lagged a lot and uh, they started to experiment with other stuff. So seeing that online advertising didn't drive much incremental business, and that's what we are really in the business of getting, market started, marketers started to think about uh, attribution more. So attribution is really telling um, uh, which channel is actually uh, uh, attributed uh, to uh, driving that incremental business. Uh, so measurement vendors started to implement models and that would unpick that. And then some marketers use that to justify spending a little bit more on awareness and drive business through the whole funnel. But all of this required a lot of data and the incentive for everyone was to create a sort of digital uh, data gold rush, which is uh, has its own set of, uh, of negatives. So that's where we find ourselves now, and I'm going to discuss some of the channels separately and some of the problems that we have with them. So for social media, it's really become rent a friend. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg might need that service, but let's not go there. Um, so we went from building communities to pay for play only, and with that I mean I don't know if you remember, but the, uh, most companies that were doing something on social were paying a lot of money to try to grow the number of people that were following their pages because then you could market to them for free. So after after many, many millions of, of, uh, of, of, of euros uh, spending on that, um, Facebook said that's all well and good, but that's, and then you know we're only going to earn much uh, once, so we, we want to keep on earning there. And um, uh, and you know they they came up with a way to do this. Uh, so right now there's only one or two percent of um, of 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 messages that you send to your audience that that get actually seen. So you need to boost to your own audience, which is not great. There's also walled gardens. So these are entirely closed off environments. There's no price transparency, no audience transparency, and no data transparency in general. 
There's also no medium is the message effect. So that used to be a big thing in marketing. And I'll give you an example. Uh, if you if you know American football, there's the Super Bowl where people actually sit down and watch the ads to judge them and then to discuss them the next day with with their colleagues or their neighbors or whatever. And um, that's that's really nice for those companies because anyone that's watching that ad knows that millions of other people are watching that too, and that infers a certain status on those companies' advertising. But that doesn't exist on social or online in general because everyone knows that you can just like show an ad to 100 people if you wanted to. There's also no contextual relevancy for the most part. So if you show an ad for a plumber to someone that's watching cat videos, that's great. But, you know, it's not really something that's going to make the connection between the uh, between the thing that people are doing and, and, and the ad that is being shown. Users also only see what the algorithm decides. So there's less and less diversity of opinions. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of toxic social effects of social media. I won't get into that now, but I, I think you're aware. So, of course, it works to some extent, and it's where the audiences are, so you're going to have to do something to make it work, but there's a lot of um, uh, negatives to it as well. For search engines, uh, we see a similar thing. So, paid is moving towards a, a black box approach where you kind of uh, have to, uh, to, to, to shut up and pay, um, like no, no questions asked. Uh, and then, and then the, the the search engine will figure out the rest. There's an inflation of cost for PPC uh, because there's less and le more and more competition and less and less availability, and um, a lowering of ROI as a, as a consequence. So it used to be that you really only had to do PPC for very transactional terms, and Google is uh, ever more expanding that into informational uh, queries. Uh, the the ones that that you know people used to be able to find the 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 brands, um, especially with the rise of AI, where you're going to only have just a few uh, providers of data that get mentioned, if at all, uh, by such an AI, and so it's going to be more and more difficult to get share of voice, which means that also your uh, your your costs are going to go up to to reach that audience. On the SEO side of things. We've moved through a few stages. So first was a stage of quantity uh, metrics. So just like get a bunch of links and, uh, and, and go from there to then more quality metrics uh, where, uh, you know, the, the quality of your website, the quality of the links really mattered to really an attention of, uh, of, of audiences. Uh, and um, again, especially with the rise of AI, the winner will take all. Uh, so there's less and less possibility to um, to to you know get your get get your traffic if you're not the the lucky winner the largest one so while it's great for conversions for paid uh, PPC advertising there's also almost no brand effect here um, study after study shows it and if you stop advertising then in a few months um, your 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 conversions will dry up this also all of this means less information choice for for consumers which is of course also a bad thing so the worst of all publishers pretty shady they always were uh in the online era at least um there's a lot of clickbait uh, a lot of outrage manufacturing and quantity over quality so you have to realize that the business model of most publishers is uh, the one of uh, of being an intermediary where on the one hand they buy cheap visitors on the other hand they try to sell those visitors for as much as possible so they they get that uh that that, that margin in between so because they have to buy it for cheaper than they sell it that means that almost by definition there needs to be a good number of robots or or just pure play fraud uh, in between in order to uh, to to make those numbers uh, and uh, if, if publishers don't have it bad enough already, AI is going to really do some nasty stuff as well. Besides quality media, and there, there, is, there are some, uh, the industry are mostly content farms with a large robot audience, and that's really not overstating things. So all things considered, who likes tracking anymore? So I would say the big five, uh, that includes Google, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, and yes, Apple. Most people at this point will go like, well, 
Apple, I thought they were all uh, pro-privacy and protecting me against tracking and stuff like this. No, it's actually a kind of a cynical move in which they are protecting their own competitive uh, advantage. They like tracking for themselves, but they don't like it for other competitors. And that's that's really what they're doing. So other stakeholders, they're not so much into tracking anymore because marketers are confused. Uh, it's not just it's not just you, <laughs> others are too. Data doesn't add up. Things show conversions that don't add additional business. Attribution models can kind of say what we want them to say. There's too much fraud and too many bad publishers. Publishers are kind of burned out because of tracking and content farms and walled gardens and fraud is eating up budgets and quality media cannot really survive on advertising revenue alone. So they, you know, they have to do something. Audiences don't really know how to who to trust because they're overloaded loaded with content and addicted to stimuli. Advertising mostly sucks and is sucks and is ignored uh, unless it demands attention, and then you get into this weird cycle of more and more annoying advertising to at least grab something of that uh, attention share. And people are worried about their privacy. So, uh, starting around the time of Snowden and RussiaGate and various huge data leaks. Uh, there became kind of a general awareness of privacy issues and regulators have started to pay attention and have made some strides in legislation. Um, private companies like Apple, as I was saying, have smartly made use of their position to use privacy as a competitive advantage. So there's some counter movement here. So what we do now? I think this is the most important question and part of the presentation. I think we have to look back and see how we used to do advertising. Uh, I'm not old enough uh, to to have lived through this, but growing up in marketing, uh, David Ogilvy was probably my favorite marketer. Um, he had this whole process of uh, going to a company and, and looking at every, every little nook and cranny and seeing something, a storyline that, that, that could grab people's attention. And then he would make ads like this at 60 miles an hour, the loudest noise in the new, new Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock. And then he had some long form copy there. It grabs your attention. It works. But uh, that's not the only thing that, that, that was working. We planned advertising based on media titles that had certain audiences, sounds familiar. Uh, there was a clear alignment of incentives because quality media attracts clear segments and that's what marketers want. Uh, they also had trust and uh, consumers had trust, publishers had trust. And I think most important for this presentation, we looked at results with statistics. So for instance, in terms of incremental sales or through awareness studies, or even through direct mail and coupons and stuff like this. So quality, trust, and statistics. Are we going back to the good old days? So just a little primer on how advertising works in general. You, I'm sure you've seen this slide at some point if you're in marketer, uh, marketing. But this is how advertising works. So it advertising increases or maintains sales and margins by increasing the chance that people will choose your brand. And they do that by making the brand easy to think of and easy to buy. So these two things, easy to think of and easy to buy, they correspond with awareness and conversion advertising. Um, and they do that uh, in the process by creating positive feelings and associations. And the way that they do this is through broad reach ads that people find relevant and enjoyable and targeted activation that they find relevant and useful. Again, awareness and conversion. Also, customer journeys are not linear. Uh, I, I know you know this, but just to, to um, um, remind you, uh, marketers think that a lot of them think that uh, viewing a landing page and viewing pricing then signing up and then you get money on the other end and there's this neat linear thing but it's actually so messy there are so many different aspects to it that you could almost give up trying to make such a journey or measuring it in this linear way you can see the same if you look at your uh, google analytics or whatever you're using i touched upon this a little bit but your data also doesn't really show what you think it does so um, your channel reports, so these are the reports from the individual uh, advertising channels. They might say the thing on the left. So PPC brought about almost 1900 conversions and SEO brought 3000 and display 2400. And these are your cost per acquisition. And then you go to your CRM and you're like, what the, 
you know, it's, it's only a small percentage of what's shown what's what's going on here. And then you might have an attribution system. And then it says that, you know, there are this many last touch conversions and this many assisted and it just all doesn't add up. And to make a decision based on this, you almost just have to kind of like close your eyes and throw a dart in the air and and pick the story that fits best your your strategy. And I think that that's what goes on a lot of the time. So um, one of the major contributing factors here is that your data is too short term. So if you look at attribution modeling, and that includes sort of last touch uh, uh, um, a conversion measurement that you might uh, do with, uh, with, 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 with the channels, that only covers 18% of the long-term results. If you do short-term econometrics, you get 42%. Uh, and if you do long-term studies, um, so, you know, really over periods of, 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 you know, six months or a year or whatever, then you get the true story. But the majority of advertising returns occur in the long term. And so you're really making bad decisions based on short term data that have a lot of drawdowns to begin with. So then also your ads are really not creative enough because of this cycle that I was talking about, where you have to be more annoying than the other guy to grab people's attention. This graph has been going up and up and up. Nearly all TV advertising annoys me. We're now up above 50%. Here's a great ad by uh, Young and Rubicon, which is a uh, uh, an advertising agency already a long time ago, but it's as applicable today as it is uh, then, as it was then. Uh, I don't know if you can read the text, but it says computers can't cry. Um, and this is really about the fact that Yes, you can use a computer uh, or you can use robots to do certain tasks for you, but you need humans for insight. You need both. You need humans plus robots. And I think if anything, that's going to have to be the story of marketing and business in general for at least the next decade or so until we have uh, general AI, um, where you combine the two in order to get the most out of things. It really requires insight. And I'll talk more about that later. So this is another slide that maybe you'll um, ha have seen, uh, which shows that you probably don't spend enough on brand building. So if you look at the yellow line, that's a sales activation, which is conversion advertising more or less. And then the, the I'm a little bit colorblind, but I think it's orange or red uh, line uh, shows what happens when you focus on brand building. And in the beginning of doing brand building, you don't get a lot of return. And so, you know, we're short term focused. So we're going to do more and more conversion advertising, whereas uh, brand building builds up over time. It's an investment in your in your in your brand. And um, the, the, I think the uh, the advice is in more online oriented businesses, you should actually do more uh, offline and in uh, more uh, offline focused businesses. So in the real world, uh, real world, uh, you should do more more online. But still, I think the average would be around 60% uh, against 40%. So that's 60 brand building, 40 conversion advertising. Uh, really interesting books from Les Binet and Peter Fields. Uh, so uh, yeah, check that out. So a last couple of slides, I promise. Um, I would say that the future is more than tracking. Uh, it's not just tracking. I think this this uh, this obsession with uh, getting all of these systems lined up with with getting data on everything into one big place, and then this this uh, illusion that you can get perfect information has to stop. I think that uh, we should use the data for what it's good for. So. Tracking data from, from channels we use for directional day-to-day -day operations, if and when appropriate. So you might say that uh, a blue ad uh, against a red ad, and we're going to just see in the next couple of weeks which gets the higher click-through rate, fine. But don't uh, make your whole business strategy based on that. You know, uh, Attribution modeling can be useful for larger companies and medium-term adjustments. These are very expensive things and um, can honestly kind of say what you want them to say, depending on the model that you pick. And then for for long term and strategic purposes, I I, I propose that we move to a black box model uh, of of marketing mix modeling, and I'll talk more about that on the next slide. 
besides this, besides the tracking thing, I think we should start to plan advertising based on titles and channels and content with quality audiences again. I think we should respect audiences and advertise with good creative design. So spend more on that than 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 mostly uh, most companies are doing now. And also to focus more on on brand building, uh, awareness advertising, not just grab conversions that might have happened anyway. So if you look at this this uh, little uh, what is it graph flowchart whatever on the on the right, you can see that the strategic value of channel tracking is quite low, but it's also quite immediate. Then attribution in the middle and marketing mix modeling is very high, but it, it takes longer term data and it doesn't uh, allow you to be very operational. So then about this black box model, uh, we look at um, uh, advertising in the way that uh, I think we used to do it, which is there's media dollars in or media euros or crowner or whatever you're using. And then something happens and then we get business euros out. What has happened, we can figure out by comparing business money to media money. And uh, we can figure it out in a few different ways. A simple one would be simply to turn off certain campaigns or channels or tactics for a while and seeing the effect on business. Crazy idea. But let's say that you turn off your PPC for a month and you compare the next couple of months and that month uh, to the uh, comparable period uh, and see what you've lost, then that's kind of very clearly what um, what what PPC would add. And, and you can do the same for all channels or even small parts within this. And if you're a multinational business, then you can do one country to to limit the, um, the, the effect. But this sort of testing is very important. Also on the SEO side, there was a study, I think it was Groupon that did this, where they actually excluded their website from uh, Google for a few hours. And they found out that a crazy percentage, I think it was like 40 or 50 or more percentage of uh, their direct traffic that was noted as direct traffic actually came from search. And so you never know what discoveries you're going to make and how that's going to impact your strategy going forward. Without turning anything off, we can also look at the correlation between input and output. Uh, so simply put, how is advertising spent related to business outcome? And you can do that even with something as simple as, as Excel, but probably better that you look up some models. I would say in general, I would rather hire a, uh, a statistician, an econometrics person or a marketing mixed modeling person than spending that same amount of money on some sort of a measurement technology or even on advertising, because this is going to pay back uh, over the long term and changes in strategy and so on. So there are also long-term effects, and you should remember that there are competitor uh, macro effects, trends, and seasonal, and many more influences to data. And there's not really a silver bullet. Uh, the stuff is complicated. So you're going to have to use art and science together, humans plus robots together. And that's really the main message here. That was my presentation for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I will um, take a look at uh, uh, some of the questions in the chat if you if you have some. How can clients deal with the cost of switching off marketing channels to do on off tests, especially uh, if to be accurate, they'd have to be fairly long experiments, uh, losing 40% of traffic even temporarily would be a disaster. Yeah, and I touched upon that um, a little bit. I hear that more often. It's difficult to justify this in the short term. Uh, you could argue that in the long term, uh, doing the on-off testing uh, is worth it because you're going to make significant changes in your strategy. Uh, but uh, if in disconsider, uh, not considering this, uh, what you could do is just take a part of your uh, uh, of your marketing. So, for instance, if you're advertising countrywide, you can exclude a certain province or if you can exclude a certain country for, for that channel and just limit the amount of uh, of, um, of of loss there and then um, uh, you know if there are significant results of course you can justify doing such a test in in more broader uh, ways mm, or you could just apply those results even though that's not entirely a good way to go about it statistically hope that answered your question Thomas okay so you've had your chance uh, thanks very much and uh, have a great day. Hope to see you again.